okay uh, friends uh, it's 8:30 pm in indian standard time and uh, so one behalf of uh, center of excellence in advanced manufacturing technology at iit kharagpur uh, myself sujapal uh, i'm professor in the department of mechanical engineering and also heading the center of excellence so i'd like to welcome you all in this mega webinar series which we named as the shattered dim manufacturing talks we have started our journey uh, in the mid of uh, march 2021 and uh, our plan is to take it forward to uh, the march 2022 we are immensely uh, you know the happy and privileged to have the speakers from across the the globe from academics and also from the industry so they have uh, you know the shared their experiences in various fields of uh, the manufacturing most of the topics are uh, oriented to industry 4.0 ai ml and uh, because uh, you know the people these days are uh, discussing about uh, the industry 4.0 which is uh, to get more insight about the process and also the product to make it faster and cheaper and better so out of uh, the you know various modules of industry 4.0 mostly the digital tools we have also seen that uh, the additive manufacturing and robotics are coming up in a big way to make the product more flexible cheaper and faster and uh, today we are very much uh, privileged and honored to have professor satyendra gupta satyendra gupta is very known in this field so i'd like to read out uh, you know his biscape dr satyendra gupta holds smith international professorship in the department of aerospace and mechanical engineering and also department of computer science in viterbi school of engineering at the university of southern california usa he serves as the director of the center for advanced manufacturing he served as a program director of the national robotics initiatives at the national science foundation from september 2012 to september 2014 dr gupta's interest are in the area of physics aware decision making to facilitate and advance the state of automation he has published more than 400 technical articles he is a fellow of american society of mechanical engineers institute of electrical and electronics engineers ieee solid modeling association sma and society of manufacturing engineers sme he serves as the editor in chief of the ASME Journal of Computing and Information Science in Engineering Dr Gupta has received numerous honors and awards for his scholarly, scholarly contributions representative examples include a young investigator award from the office of naval research in 2000 robert galvin outstanding young manufacturing engineer award from the society of manufacturing engineers in 2001 career award from the national science foundation in 2001 presidential early career award for scientists and engineers in 2001 invention of the year award at the university of maryland in 2007 and kosh toshiba award from asme in 2011 excellence in research award from asme computers and information in engineering division in 2013 professor gupta is the distinguished alumnus of iit roorkee in 2014 and asme design automation award in 2021 he has also received 10 best paper awards at the international conference so with this i'd like to request professor gupta to deliver his talk uh, great so thank you very much for that very kind and generous introduction uh, if you can enable screen sharing then i can start sharing my screen yeah. Okay. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. It's it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh great. So again, uh thank you for giving me an opportunity to present. Um uh, it's a truly a privilege and an honor to be invited to be a speaker in this series. So today I'm going to basically describe our work uh related to additive manufacturing uh which has been enabled by use of advanced robotic technology so my research focus uh, is mainly on two areas the first area is 
we use robots to enable next generation manufacturing. And the second theme of my work is that we want to leverage advanced manufacturing technologies, such as additive manufacturing, uh, advanced composites, and then utilize that to enable realization of next generation robots. So these are the two different links in my work. So today I'm going to largely talk about use of robots to improve manufacturing theme. But before I do that, let me just share with you a broader overview of my research. So we do quite a bit of work uh, where we use robots in a wide variety of ways uh, to improve manufacturing. And our work spans bin picking, kitting, robotic finishing, collaborative assembly, composite layup, machine tending, additive manufacturing, inspection. Today, I'm going to talk about additive manufacturing. To just give you a flavor for what kind of other things happens in my lab, I'm going to show you a video of our work on composite layup. A robotic cell is smart and it can adapt to uncertainties during the layup process. The cell uses AI algorithms combined with the force and vision sensors to intervene and avoid defects. The system uses advanced computer vision to detect defects and calls humans for assistance. Humans play an important role in robotic cell operations. They provide the cell with high level strategy to generate good quality plans. cell can produce defect-free composite parts. We believe this work will accelerate the adoption of composite materials and lead to the realization of innovative design concepts. So that was kind of flavor of our work uh, in uh, using robots in advanced manufacturing. So that's where we have been uh, utilizing all the AI and industry 4.0 technologies with advanced sensing and, and, and monitoring to make sure that we can do uh, automation of processes which are very hard to control. The second uh, type of work that happens in our lab is building of robots. So we use 3D printing, advanced composites, soft material to build an array of exciting new uh, you know, class of robots. And this view graph shows some of the robots built in our lab. So we have looked at building flapping wing air vehicles. We have built robots which locomote by rectilinear gates uh, out wheels. We have built robotic hands which are soft in nature with uh, controllable uh, stiffness. We have built uh, robotic fish uh, which again made out of soft material. So these are all different uh, kind of robotic platforms that we have built. And let me show you a quick video to just kind of illustrate this work. So this is our work on flapping wing uh, air vehicles. So here the idea is that we want to build a platform which flies by flapping its wing. Uh, so we have built many different generations of this vehicle, uh, this uh, particular uh, platform has, we have integrated in the third generation's flexible solar cells in it, which then allows it to harvest energy uh, from sun and then charge the battery and fly with that. Uh, we have also put autopilot in it and that allows us to basically fly autonomously. So you can basically use it autopilot to uh, loiter about a point or you can send it to a particular waypoint. So we have done that type of uh, or integration of that type of technology in this platform. And uh, we have also added uh, some propeller at the back of the vehicle to give it 
thrust boost then that allows it to basically perform aggressive uh, aerial maneuvers or uh, interesting kind of acrobatics. So that kind of gives you flavor of the work that's done in building of robots. So now coming back to basically the main uh, topic of today's presentation. So let's begin with some background. Uh, so from the manufacturing process, what would you want out of it? You want manufacturing process to be able to offer features that deliver high performance that usually then allows the manufacturing process to be able to produce geometric complexity and material heterogeneity because these are the two things that if you have these two features then you can actually deliver high performance uh, in your products you want low cost you want low lead time you want high degree of personalization and you want low environmental impact so this is kind of your wish list for what manufacturing should do for you so if you now examine traditional manufacturing, so here are a couple of observations. Traditional manufacturing can deliver low cost and custom tooling. So injection molding, die casting, you build a custom tool and using that, then you can basically deliver products which are low cost. The very fast cycle times because you're using this uh, custom tooling and that then enables you to deliver low cost. Uh, you can get moderate complexity. Lead time is high because it takes time to build the tool. And there's of course lack of customization because this is, you know, same tool is going to be used to make lots of parts. Other strategy is that you can achieve customization. You can make exactly one off kind of product through general purpose tools. So a lot of sheet metal bending and machining can actually, you know, use for that. Now you can have moderate lead time, moderate complexity, cycle times are not going to be slow because you will be building the part one feature at a time. So you will be machining one pocket, one hole, one bend at a time. So cycle times are going to be slow. And that means that if you're spending a lot of time on the machine, your cost is going to be high. So these are the two general strategies and basically they have their own pros and cons. Now let's take a look at nature and see what happens in nature. So nature basically grows product uh, in place. You don't create parts and assemble. So you can compare a horse with a motorcycle. Motorcycle makes you know using mass production type of processes. If, if it is a mass produced uh, bike and then you're going to assemble it. In nature, horse grows in place. So nature has very interesting way of doing things and it offers complexity that far exceeds the complexity that is, you know, seen in engineered products. However, nature, things grow slowly, so it takes a while for things to grow. And material choices in nature are limited in, in nature. And therefore, that means that performance range that you can get out of these uh, nature created uh, you know, creatures is limited. Uh, obviously, temperature range is going to be very limited in which the horse can operate. While by using engineered material, your performance range can be quite large. But the key insight from nature is that we are not creating parts and assembling them because the moment you adopt that philosophy, complexity that you can achieve is going to be limited. So additive manufacturing is technology which uses digital models uh, to basically automatically uh, build a part by creating a part layer by layer. So you are going to basically assemble the part in layer. There's no part specific tooling. And since you are building part in place, you have tremendous geometric possibilities. 
So additive manufacturing benefits are that we can create shapes that are simply not possible in traditional manufacturing. Uh, additive manufacturing can offer you geometric complexity, which is uh, simply not possible in other traditional processes. Not only it can do the new type of shape, but also those shapes are not uh, offering you any cost penalty. Customization is possible. A uh, lot of additive manufacturing processes are being designed right now so that you don't have to do post fabrication assembly operation, which again helps with the lead time aspect of things. And this view graph shows some interesting things that people have done. Now, if you dig deeper and you kind of figure it out, okay, so can existing traditional additive manufacturing meet all my requirements or is there room that we, we can do something new there in that space? So it turns out that traditional additive manufacturing where you are stacking 2D layers to build 3D geometry has also some inherent limitations. Since you are making now approximating a truly 3D geometry with very, very thin 2D layers, uh, most additive manufacturing process has long build time if you're trying to build anything which is large. So, for example, in our lab, we have a nice uh, metal DMLS metal 3D printer. Using that, we printed this flow mixer. It takes 35 hours to print. Parts. Since you are a stacking 3D layer, particularly if you are interested in composite material, part will not have desired mechanical performance because now fibers are oriented in the layer and that creates its own sets of challenges. Material options are limited. Uh, you cannot create, for example, you cannot print uh, using conventional additive manufacturing, the wing of uh, our uh, microwave vehicle. A lot of support structures printed, which then you have to take it out. So all of this, you know, create challenges. So basically, traditional additive manufacturing was invented in 80s to deal with that time's computing technology. So therefore, computation was simple and assembly of these small 3D layers, uh, you know, made sure that you can automate the entire pipeline. But this particular way of doing things where you are stacking up 2D layers to create 3D geometry has inherent limitations. Now, so on the other hand, we take a look at it. What you see is that traditionally, machines will be 10 times bigger than whatever you're trying to create. Now, people argue that some of the earliest example of additive manufacturing are pyramids, where basically humans, which were building them, were creating things which were 100 times bigger than their size scale. So you see another limitation when you are trying to make things out of enclosed machines, then you will be able to inherently needing much, much, much bigger machine to create parts. On the other hand, humans have demonstrated that uh, agents can create things which are 100 times bigger than them. So if you think about these two issues that why do we want to live in this prison of 2D layers and why you want to be in the enclosed machines and if you throw those things out the window, then suddenly exciting visions start you know, emerging. So we want to be able to realize flexible additive manufacturing by using a team of robots. So we want multiple different robots building part for us. We want to use non-planar layers. We want to be able to print really large parts much bigger than the size of the robot. We will have new sensing technologies as you were seeing in our composite work, which will enable in-situ monitoring and control. Cell can not only deposit material, it can also place prefabricated components and it can do automated post-processing. So that's kind of our long-term vision. That's where we are going. Now I'm gonna show you what we have done uh, so far. So the focus of our work is an additive, uh, then of course that, that requires us to make advances in robotics. And then since we will be dealing with this complex, crazy 3D layers and significantly more complex trajectories that will of course require advances in AI. 
And if you want to learn more about the challenges in doing it, then you can take a look at our survey paper, which was published in Additive Manufacturing in January 2020. So let's begin with the basics. So printing using conformal layers. So the first idea is that why not just go away from these planar layers? Let's print with conformal layers. And obviously, in that case, for certain class of products, the moment you can have truly 3D layers, you can actually get significantly superior mechanical properties. So now the question is, can this be done? So we build a setup uh, using a 60 degree of freedom robot. Now we have not experimented with continuous fiber in this setup. However, it's possible to you know, put a print head which can have continuous fiber. We have mainly been using chalk fiber in this work. So by uh, printing a wide variety of thin uh, shell geometries, we have shown that you can actually achieve build time comparable to that of traditional uh, planar layers. However, your mechanical properties are significantly better. This video just illustrates how the process works. So this printing is done on a substrate. So use robot to do printing on a substrate. And then when you're done, your fibers are aligned the way you would like them to be aligned. And that way you're gonna get a significantly better quality uh, part than you would get if you were, you know, approximating this crazy geometry by planar layers. So it's possible to print using robot uh, and actually create interesting uh, parts with conformal layers. Once you can do that, then suddenly starts opening up multi-material printing possibilities. So why not, you know, put a multi-extruder on, on the robot and then print with the multi-material. So we have done that. So we have built a three extruder system and the three extruder system, you can print actually. So the previous example, you saw that we were using a prefabricated uh, tool on which you are printing, but you can also use one of those extruder to do basically uh, print support material. Or you could use these extruder to do multiple different material, multicolor. So we've demonstrated that all of it can be done. And since again, you have truly 3D printing, you can create all kinds of interesting things that you cannot if you were basically restricted to printing in planar layers. Another interesting possibility that it opens up is multi-resolution printing. So typically what happens is that if you're printing uh, in a traditional setup, you can actually use large nozzle size to give you fast build times, but poor surface finish, or you can use small diameter nozzle to give you good surface finish, but very long build time. So why not, uh, you know, do multi-resolution printing? But multi-resolution printing, you cannot do if you're printing in 3D layers, the idea will not work. So of course you need then uh, conformal printing. So using conformal printing, we have demonstrated that inside of an object, you can print it super fast using large diameter nozzle and exterior skins of the part, you can print them using small diameter nozzle. And that enables you to basically achieve lower build time and good surface finish. We have built two different setups. So this view graph that I'm showing here is basically from our two robot setup. And the view graph I'm showing here is with from our uh, single robot setup with a multi extrusion system. So again, it's possible for us to do that where we can get the best trade off between build time and surface finish. 
Another interesting possibility once you start printing with the robot is that you can actually achieve test additive manufacturing. So many parts, it turns out that if you're doing these crazy type of geometry, you may print enormous amount of support structure, which is wasting material, taking time, and then you have to remove it, which again is going to take more time. So can you do support test printing? So in this case, we're using a two robot setup. One robot is holding the build platform. The second robot is actually doing the printing. And using this, uh, then you can actually build uh, these structures with significant overhang. And uh, that enables you to basically not utilize support structures. So, so this is another interesting benefit of basically uh, using robots. So now we are able to basically print without using support structure because we can just rotate the build platform and make sure that we can do gravity compensation and therefore uh, we don't need uh, support structure. So this is just showing you, you know, examples of different kind of things that we have attempted to print using this technology. And all the videos that I'm showing is posted in our center's, you know, uh, uh, YouTube channel. So if you want to watch these videos again, you can go and check them out. So in, in thin shell structure, which often people are interested in creating other composites, it turns out that basically getting rid of support structure simply means that you can, uh, you know, lower your build time quite a bit. And of course, you want to get more detail, then you can take a look at our additive manufacturing uh, paper from March 2020 on this work. So not everything you want to print using basically uh, extrusion based process, because if you want to integrate solar cells, or if you want to create a uh, certain type of uh, structures, in that case, you're better off using sheet lamination process. So we have also built an automated cell for doing it. And that allows us to basically create wings for our uh, microwave vehicles and also interesting kind of uh, a thermal insulation type of structures using additive uh, manufacturing. So quite a bit of work we've also done basically in sheet lamination using robots. Since you have a robotic cell and you are able to print conformal layers, it's very easy for us to basically pick up a battery or a motor or a sensor and just insert it while the things are being printed using a second robot. And that then allows us to basically uh, create all kind of interesting structures with embedded sensors and electronics and actuators. Uh, so that's another capability that we get. Now, because of embedded videos, uh, my slide uh, were really large. So what I'm gonna do would be switch over to a different presentation and uh, show you the second part of the talk, which is from a different file. If you just give me a second, I will uh, open up uh, that file and show you the second part of the presentation. Uh, are you able to see uh, the slides now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Okay, great. So until now, I've been mostly in the extrusion-based process. We were, I was mainly describing polymer process, uh, sometimes with basically chalk carbon fiber. And of course, sheet one, we were experimenting with certain kind of uh, uh, metallic sheet as well. 
We have also worked quite a bit on Wicked, which is a wire arc welding based AM that allows us to then use, you know, basically uh, use metal structures in, in additive manufacturing. So this is, you know, basically our setup for doing conformal VAM, where we want to create, do want to do conformal printing, but now with a wire arc. So similar idea, we are depositing material using basically a VAM system. And we wanted to demonstrate that not only you can do this in a planar, but you can also do conformal. So we have done that. And, you know, we, we have demonstrated that you can print all kind of interesting type of geometries. Uh, we've done some material characterization and we have shown that material properties seem to be reasonable as a result of doing this. So hopefully by now I have, you know, presented arguments that why using robot in additive manufacturing uh, is useful. Uh, to just give a quick summary, it improves mechanical properties due to use of conformal layers. So you are no longer limited to creating 2D layers. You can create 2D, 3D layers. And if you can truly create 3D layers, then you can perhaps use thicker layers. And you can also uh, basically get rid of support material if you have capability of tilting the base and you can print in 3D, then you can get rid of the base platform. Uh, sorry, uh, get rid of the support material and you can just tilt the base. So that also speeds up the process. You can insert prefabricated components during the printing using a second robot, robot really great for doing assembly. And if you are, uh, you know, able to do truly conformal printing, then you could, you know, build a system with multiple different print heads, which could be printing many different materials. So we have presented evidence for all of this, and we have documented that all of this is useful and can be used to create functionally interesting structures. So what are the challenges? What the research issues are? So second part of the talk, I would like to at least give you some preview of some challenging problem that you need to solve. Now, the moment you start using robots, uh, robots are significantly more complex system than, uh, you know, your nicely decoupled Cartesian X, Y, Z actuation system. So trajectory planning is much more complex. Now, your, when you're printing in 3D, you know, there's interesting complex interaction which are happening and you need to regulate your process parameters appropriately. You got to figure it out what the right uh, set of parameters are. Uh, robots, we'll also just briefly, I'll touch upon it, are not really uh, super accurate. So how do you get good performance out of it? Where to place the part? If you're going to do multi-robot, then how do you design the cell? So these are all fundamental research questions that need to be answered uh, in the AI domain now uh, in order for us to realize the technology. So first, let's just talk about path constraint trajectory planning. So now, remember, we are uh, getting the robot tip uh, to follow, you know, a, a particular constraint trajectories. So we have built basically a path constrained uh, robotic trajectory generator, which can actually work on a high degree of freedom system. Because remember, I, even though examples that I was showing you are all six dots in the 3D printing, but you could print with a seven degree of freedom robot, or you can have two collaborating robot uh, doing interesting things. So traditional approaches which people have used to do path constrained trajectory planning have some inherent limitations, and that simply means that uh, they are unable to generate uh, trajectories. So our idea in this case is to use an adaptive representation and use successive refinement strategies to solve this high dimension nonlinear parametric optimization problem, which will often have conflicting constraints. So the way we solve this problem is basically we create a optimization problem instance, then we begin with some approximate solution that 
initially lets us estimate how rich the representation needs to be. And then on the fly, basically we adopt representation. And then in this case, we also use successive refinement to keep you know, adding a limited number of constraints at each stage that enables us to solve some really, really uh, hard uh, problem. Now, this technology is uh, process agnostic. Of course, we use it for additive, but this technology is useful for a wide variety of complex path constraint reduction planning problem. Uh, our paper on this one was just published uh, in International Journal of Robotics Research. So if you want to learn more about how we solve this problem, then you can you know, take a look at that paper. Another interesting problem is that, you know, uh, now we cannot use constant trajectory parameters. So if you're doing conformal printing and we are making tight corners, then we really need to regulate velocity. And since detailed physics model may not always be available, so can we use machine learning to learn that? Now, in this case, in VAM, it turns out that if you make super tight corner, you're going to see the bulging of material. So in this case, what we did was that we let robot do some experiment. It printed basically different kind of geometries using constant speed and as well as trying out, you know, slowing down at the corners and using that, then we scanned the part, we built the model and using that, uh, our goal was to learn how are we going to basically regulate the velocity at these tight corners? So we looked at, you know, cross sections of uh, different corners, what kind of uh, cross section signatures we were seeing, which were, and our goal was whenever we were seeing cross sections, which were not resembling in the linear portions of the path, then pick up some parameters and then try to correlate them to basically velocities. So in this case, we wanted to automatically label all the outliers. So we're using anomaly detection techniques for that. And then there we wanted to do sensitivity analysis and then see what kind of slowdown of velocity helps us get rid of it. So we were able to again learn in this case using unsupervised learning how to regulate velocities at corner to create uh, these parts. So that's an example of again using some advanced machine learning techniques uh, to aid uh, additive uh, manufacturing. And again, this paper was uh, basically published this year earlier in ASME Computers and Information Engineering Conference. Now, robots, articulated robots, actually have high repeatability but very poor accuracy. So your repeatability might be 50 micron, but your accuracy might be. Uh, half a millimeter. Now, obviously, if you execute your path on a robot with that, then you're not going to print very good quality part. So then the question becomes that, you know, how do we build a compensation scheme so that we can do significantly better uh, printing? So idea here is that can, again, robot do its experiments given a particular trajectory, learn what kind of inaccuracies it's exhibiting. And from that, teach itself a compensation strategy. And then you can apply this on the top of an existing controller. So we're not going to replace robot controller. We will use industrially robust controller. It's just that we're going to do trajectory compensation scheme on top of it. So idea is that you have some input strategy. You sample it. You execute it. You see what kind of error you're getting, you train a neural network and the neural network uh, basically, basically start compensating the trajectory. When you have to basically run your trajectory, you compensate it and run it. So again, in this case, we can use a neural network to compensate online. And we have explored this idea in two different domain. Now, we can basically do compensation uh, in the workspace, and that was the first exploration that we did 
where we looked at the time, the path, and orientation separately in three different networks. And we demonstrated that if you run compensated trajectory, if you just sample only 4% of the trajectory, then you can actually reduce the error dramatically uh, for, for these industrial robots. And that enables you to print very, very accurately. So this, you know, basically shows that if you took an industrial robot and you try to draw a circle on a moving conveyor, what would happen? So if you try to draw a circle on a moving conveyor, here we have calculated what shape it should be drawing, but it's just that moving conveyor magnifies that particular error. Now, if you compensate a trajectory, it turns out even in a moving conveyor, when you're trying to draw a shape, you can actually, uh, you know, achieve significant accuracy. So, so that was our exploration of uh, basically when we were compensating in the workspace. Workspace ideas work well, but when we start seeing redundant manipulators where the significant coupling, so in that case, direct compensation in workspace is not possible, and we have to now start looking into compensation and configuration space. So some of our most recent work where we have demonstrated that basically uh, that you can actually start compensation in the configuration space of the robot. And uh, this paper was just very recently published. So again, you can have dramatic reduction uh, in, in, you know, basically performance if you can compensate uh, basically in the configuration space. And you can deal with uh, basically uh, both time lag as well as the joint uh, accuracies. So this just summarizes and shows you that even though industrial robot when it del get delivered to you may have you know, significantly poor accuracy properties, why the repeatability will be very good and if you train using neural networks and compensation schemes, you can actually get them to print quite well. Now, since robots are, you know, highly nonlinear system, the performance varies all over the workspace. It turns out that it's also important that you situate your part in the right place, because if you don't situate your part in the right place, then you are not going to get a very good performance. So in our recent work, we have been exploring where should we situate the part? Because if the part is small and if you situate in the right region of the robot workspace, uh, and, and this work is not using advanced compensation schemes. In this case, we're just using uncompensated trajectory just to magnify that uh, error problem. So in this case, you can see if you situate part in one place, you get very good print. And situate in some other place, you get actually really lousy print. So now the question is, can we build this error model for the robot workspace and then figure it out where to print the part? So in our recent work, we have actually built a very detailed error model. So where we account for, you know, uh, controller errors and uh, all different other kind of errors that the robot can make. And then basically we have built an optimization on top of it that will allow you to pick the right location for the part in the robot workspace, which will give you highest possible uh, accuracy. So this work was uh, published in IEEE Robotics and uh, you know, uh, Conference this year. And this shows that uh, there are regions of the workspace where you will be able to print parts successfully and you'll get very good accuracy. So different kind of part geometries are different locations. And again, different kind of robot, just to different places where you want to print the part. And again, variation in the worst accuracy can be as high as 20% uh, on uncompensated uh, trajectories. Now, of course, if you do trajectory compensation, then some of this will reduce, but on an uncompensated trajectories, variation in terms of accuracy achievable from one location to the other can be quite dramatic. So that just shows you different kind of 
part geometries and it's ideal location for them to print inside the workspace. So that gives you another flavor of what challenging problem one needs to solve if you are going to be doing printing. Now, when you're going to print with multiple different robots, then how do you design the work cell? So we have began collaboration with Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, where they have this uh, setup where they print these large metal parts using multi-robot cells. The question is, how should robot be situated if you were going to be printing this large part? And as I mentioned before, there are many, many different considerations that have to be accounted for in design of such a cell. So we want to make sure that no robot is idle. So roughly the work is equally distributed. All the, you know, points that are assigned to the robot are within the reachability limits of the robot. And paths are consistent, and we'll talk about path consistency constraints in a few minutes. Now, we pose the problem that, you know, you have to place these three robots. Where should this robot be distributed? And we again convert this into a nonlinear optimization problem. Except that in this case, we have to also divide the task among the robots. So we solve the problem in two stages. First stage, we basically partition the work by, uh, you know, uh, decomposing the part into three subparts, and each robot get assigned, and then you try to locate the robot appropriately. So you solve these two problems, you know, concurrently. So for if you're building a part like this, this seems to be the best solution uh, where you know you can place the robot. Now we've compared it against basically your conventional approaches where if you just you know have a fixed cell and you try to build this part, what happens? It turns out that you're gonna see significant amount of IK inconsistencies. Even though part is reachable in middle of it, you have to switch off the arc and uh, you have to reposition the robot uh, in a different uh, kinematic family to continue the printing. Uh, for this part, you know, it, it, it requires a different configuration. Again, the similar kind of problem. If you use uh, our approach, then you don't have those kind of problems. Yeah, so again, uh, using, you know, basically this technology, we can also do some fabrication where we can basically tilt the robot base and then compensate for gravity. And as I was mentioning before, robots are excellent for doing, you know, basically assembly. So we can do insertion of prefabricated component in AM, and we can integrate inspection prognostics and health management technologies uh, in uh, additive manufacturing cells as well. And we have made a tremendous amount of advancement in doing that in the robotic cell. So that uh, concludes basically my technical presentation. I would like to acknowledge all my students who have done wonderful work. I get to present on their behalf. So it's a truly, again, a privilege and honor to have all these students uh, working on these exciting topics. Uh, we have been fortunate to have wide variety of you know, funding agencies supporting our work. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, all of those funding agencies. And again, we have tremendously benefited from our interaction with uh, many different companies, which have helped us uh, tremendously uh, in, in, in our endeavors. So my intention today was to basically, you know, convince you that using robot, we can do many more interesting things in additive then we will not be able to do in a conventional 2D stacking of layers. So I hopefully I, I gave you a glimpse of possibilities that if you start using robots, then uh, you can do interesting things. Now, but then the immediately people ask the second question, okay, but robots are much more complex systems. And uh, in order to use robots, we have to then encounter all these very challenging problem that we don't encounter when we build these decoupled, uh, you know, uh, three-axis systems. 
uh, can we deal with those problems? So the second part of the talk was trying to convince you that using all the advances in AI, we are now able to handle those challenging problems and we are making progress and we can generate trajectories for really complex uh, robotic systems. We can compensate those trajectories. We can figure it out what kind of errors we are going to be getting and then we can figure it out how to place the robots. We can design the cells. So hopefully I have convinced you that you should look at robots as a possible uh, agents to do your editive and you will gain some benefit out of it. And also hopefully I've convinced you that this is intellectually fertile area in order for us to use robot. There's a lots of tough problems that need to be solved. And uh, that will give you tremendous excitement and joy in terms of chasing those hard problems and, and making, you know, progress on, on getting work done in that space. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude uh, my presentation. I went fast and I covered lots of different topics. I included references to all of our uh, papers which discuss those topics in great detail. So if you are interested in getting a copy of any of those publications, you can reach out to me. I'll be happy to share those papers with you. So once again, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you, Professor Gupta, for your wonderful, uh, you know, the, the research work that you have demonstrated. And I must say that you do have all the four things at, at your end. The large research group, good funding, uh, industry support, and your expertise. So all the four things are there with you, and, and that, you know, demonstrates the, the level of work that you have done. A few questions from my side, uh, uh, since the topic is very much interested, and we are also doing a little bit of uh, uh, the research in this area. Uh, you know, the, the questions are quite obvious. Uh, it may seem obvious to you. You know, uh, you have uh, nicely demonstrated the, the supportless uh, structure printing, which is amazing. Uh, my question is that, uh, is it possible to print for any type of material for the same geometry? So Matrix we can right now print in plastic, we can print in metal and we can print and composite. So those are the three things that we have demonstrated that can be done. Yeah, you know, my question is that for a particular geometry, if I would like to produce, if, if, if I look to, uh, like to get it printed from the different types of the materials, geometry remains the same. Is it, mm -hmm. does uh, material play an important role there? So, I mean, uh, material does not, I mean, as long as the material, so material plays the following role, right? So remember when you're depositing material is liquid, uh, for a short period of time, right? If it doesn't solidify fast enough, then you're gonna get in yourself in trouble. As long as it solidifies fast enough, then there's no problem. Uh, you you mentioned about the multimaterial printing. You know the how far we are from the sensor printing, in situ sensor printing, uh, while printing the job itself. So, so sensor printing. So the challenge in additive right now is the following. Right? I mean, you you individually people have capabilities. So people can print really exquisite sensors in the machine where printing sensor may take a couple of hours, right? Uh, they can give you very high resolution and can print the sensor. But if you're trying to print sensor in situ in the context of a larger structure, it's not economically viable approach right now because the time it will take you in the high resolution that will take you to print the sensor with that process and then embed things around it would be tough. So my approach to that has always been that at least in the short term, you don't want to print sensors and motors and batteries in situ. You want to basically prefabricate them and you want to just insert them in the structure and just print around them. So that's kind of what, what my approach is. Okay. And uh, you know the uh, you have shown the example of the worm, you know, where arc already manufacturing, you know, welding based process right. and all. Now, in case of welding, we all know that residual stress is a concern because when the molten material gets uh, solidified. Right. So, uh, how do you take into the you know the corrective measures for uh, for 
uh, you know the residual stress corrections and because the distortion will come up when the metal gets solidified absolutely absolutely so there are few different approaches that people have been investigating so again when right now is a very popular process in us and several places in asia now we have been largely looking at the path planning and you know trajectory compensation end of it but people have been looking into basically wide variety of way of handling residual stress some of it basically is now involved in basically doing post uh, print heat treatment and then trying to figure it out what distortion will happen during the heat treatment process and then compensating the geometry at the front end. So that's kind of one avenue that some people are pursuing. Some people are interested in kind of knowing that can something be done uh, you know, during printing, right? Can, can some intervention be performed during printing? Uh, so that involves basically much better thermal control where you try to control a uh, process uh, thermally and that prevents basically buildup of excessive you know residual stresses so people have been investigating different areas, but that's not a topic that i have pursued myself you mentioned about the multi you know the agent printing you know multiple robots are working together uh, simultaneously and all right so uh, has your group worked on the uh, the the application of the ai in case of uh, rescheduling the job in case of failure of uh, or wrongdoing of uh, a particular robot so that's not something that we have worked on it yet, but that's where we are going. But I know that you know some of our collaborators are already working on their problem. So dynamically, so for example, if so, not only a robot failing, but I mean, as you said, but also sometimes what happens that so let's say you're doing RAM with three robots, there may be delayed arc initiation for one of the robots. So you know one of the robots may have to try three times to initiate arc and uh, that just may delay it right and therefore you have to redistribute the task dynamically so uh, our collaborators have been looking at it and that's a topic of extreme interest yeah. we certainly need to investigate the topic so uh, you know the professor gupta there may be some questions at uh, the chat box uh, so if, if you don't mind uh, reading these questions from there uh, Sure. So let me see how can I get to the. And I request the audience to uh, place the questions in the chat box itself. Uh, okay. So the first question is: Could you please comment on the issue of reaching strength compared comparable to conventional forming uh, from solid sheets? Uh, are you doing any work on printed circuit board with gable, etc.? So. Now, when we look at it, basically, uh, process of sheet lamination, we are not going to be uh, reaching, uh, you know, so sheet itself will have, you know, basically properties of whatever you get the form sheet. But when you start stacking them up, you're not going to see, you know, uh, strength comparable to solid uh, sheets, but we can design around it. We, we can you know build structure in such a way that we don't need uh, basically strength uh, shear strength between the sheets we can just engineer it appropriately a uh, second part of the question is are you working uh, any work on printed circuit board with gable not with gable but we are working on basically uh, our current research is basically uh, printing on the circuit boards basically right some some electronic connections on, on circuit board. So, I mean, that work is still not mature enough for me to talk about it, but in the lab, we are currently working on basically printing on flexible substrates, uh, basically electronic circuits so that we can uh, enable that. So that's the only question that I saw on chat. Maybe. Yeah, I think uh, there is no other questions right now. Uh, quickly, uh, the audience, if you have got any queries in your mind, please, uh, you know, write. Yeah. So one question is that. What are typical L by S then? Uh, I'm not following that question. 
okay let us move to the next one can you please comment on the challenges of uh, in manufacturing of functionally functionally graded graded materials through warm so how warm is effective in uh, printing different types of material so, so warm, yeah so warm can be quite good you are doing discrete uh, material switching so for example you can print one layer or a one grid of steel then you can print another layer or of another grid of steel but continuous grading is not possible currently in man so you can do discrete layers and materials have to be somewhat you know uh, comparable from temperature perspective because again if the material melts the underlying substrate which has been formed melts during you know the position of the next layer then it's not going to work but the material are consistent in terms of their thermal characteristics then people have demonstrated that you can actually do multi material map yeah uh, so the another question is that uh, how do you compensate the gravity effect in robots uh, while printing in warm process because as the you know the height of uh, the print increases and the material doesn't get uh, you know the the solidified so because of the load so how how the corrective measures are taken by the robots so basically robot itself is printing basically so you, you situate the robot you know a constant depth from basically the top of the layer and the robot has a built in controller which is actually monitoring the arc voltage and through this is is trying to maintain that uh, basically depth so you are running another controller to make sure that you know your, your process in terms of uh, the distance from the robot uh, you know to the tip of the torch to the layer top of the other previous substrate can be maintained so there's a controller running to do that and of course we have relatively uh, simple uh, setup right now in the lab but people have built all kind of very sophisticated setup with all kind of very interesting in situ sensing because right now we are limited to basically uh, in our setup to very limited sensing that we can do but all this excitement which is happening in robotic welding so another parallel movement in us is now build this autonomous uh, welding robot and they have matured sensing technology quite a bit and as that sensing technology becomes available uh, to van community then we will be able to do even even better things in that space yeah one question is from professor cs kumar professor kumar is uh, a renowned researcher in the field of additive manufacturing in india so professor kumar has mentioned that given the accuracy of robots and higher degrees of freedom machines what do you see is the limit of accuracy of 3d printed jobs by the robotics based strategies for aim in near future sure so basically so let me answer the question in the following way large industrial robot at least the one which we see in our lab their repeatability ranges anywhere from 50 micron uh, to 250 micron so these are basically repeatability numbers now when we get a factory calibrated robot its accuracy may be off by a factor of 20. so for example a 50 micron robot basically uh, actually produce a millimeter scale accuracy now when you do a very very careful calibration of the robot you can drive that number you know significantly better now then you can apply some advanced compensation scheme if i were to guess right now uh, i would guess that we should be able to get to probably a factor of three of repeatability if we do everything right so then if let's say you get a 50 micron calibrated robot i'm sorry repeatability robot then after very careful calibration we can and compensation scheme we can start approaching 150 micron we haven't done that yet but that's what i believe is doable 
Yeah, two more questions are there. One from uh, IIT Roper, Mr. Anupam Agrawal. Mr. Agrawal has mentioned how to take care of reactive metals additive manufacturing using robotic assisted AM process as the workspace needs to be kept under argon gas or noble gas environment, particularly with respect to powder based process. This is one question from uh, Mr. Agrawal. And then other question is there from Mr. Gupta is that uh, could you please explain which one of the two approaches of research would be more fruitful working on addressing on or on addressing robotics problems and AM problems separately and independently or working on both the areas in conjuncted fashion understanding the requirements and limitations of each other. So first let me answer the first question which is about reactive uh, materials. Now powder bed is a entirely different technology right. Uh, in case of powder bed, I'm sure robots can play a role. I have not explored uh, the robotics and powder bed process, so it's very difficult for me to comment on that. Now, in case of VAM and in case of powder fed process, where people have been now using robots routinely, both of them, you know, building a chamber where you can control the environment is possible, and others have done that. In my lab, we have not done that, but others have done that. So that's not an issue. You can really build a chamber where you can actually control, uh, you know, and you can do argon, nitrogen, uh, appropriate combination of the inert gases, and, and that should be okay. And you can also basically uh, somewhat control uh, temperature there also locally for the process. So that's kind of uh, what you know, my response to the first one is how, how things work in powder bed, I do not know yet. I mean, in terms of robot and powder bed. So powder fed and powder bed are two different things and powder fed, we know a lot. I mean, how to do that thing with the robot. Now, the way the approach that we follow in our lab is that we first build a setup with the robot. We, you know, basically, Go ahead and start printing with the robot, whatever we know. And that often tells us what robotics problem we need to solve. So we begin by exploration in AM. And when we see what kind of defects we are getting, what kind of problem we are getting, that informs us in terms of what we can do in terms of robotics. So that's the approach that we have taken. So in a way that we are attacking basically AM and robotics problem at the same time because uh, you know it's difficult for us to study these two things completely independently. I left out one question: is that the in your PCB work, what are the minimum lines and spaces? So again, that work is very very preliminary in nature. We are conducting experiments as of now, uh, so you know I cannot give any definitive answer to that work right now, but we are aiming for things in the range of basically 50 to 100 micron uh, line width kind of technology. So that's kind of what our uh, objective is. But, uh, but again, I mean, we have not demonstrated that work yet, but that's experiment that we're doing in the lab actually right now. The uh, question is from Umkar, but it is not uh, complete. Issues related to materials deposition when integration of additive manufacturing and inkjet printing printed electronics. Let us leave this question because it's not complete. Yeah, uh, with this, uh, let us uh, you know finish the question and answer session because uh, uh, it's already 9:48 in our time. And uh, Professor Gupta, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful you know, the talk and the research works. Uh, and uh, we are really grateful that you have taken out uh, time for you from your delivery, I mean, busy schedule and all. Uh, we are really grateful to you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm happy to, you know, basically participate. And as I said, if people want to get copies of any of our papers that I mentioned, yeah. Uh, yeah. reach out to me and I'll be happy to send you those papers. 
yeah definitely we'll be in touch with you for future collaboration as well uh, i i now request uh, uh, ananta to let us know uh, the the speakers from the next weeks thank you professor gupta thank you the next we could be mr dipankar ghosh from uh, 3m uh, professor uh, mr ghosh will be talking about advanced dielectric materials and applications in manufacturing and then on 30th of uh, october arjun mahatra would be talking of uh, the scope and opportunities for entrepreneurship in product design and manufacturing with this i'd like to finish today's session thank you so much for your presence